Chi Kham Will. Chi Kham Will. What's good, y'all? Welcome to episode number two of the Creative Process Podcast. This is Garrett Campbell Wilson, aka G Cam Will. Don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button. Special guest today is a contemporary American Impressionist figurative painter and digital artist based in the Boston area. His name is Rick Berry, and he is a versatile artist who is self taught and learned how to draw from an early age. And today he's with us telling stories that unfold in real time through the medium of oil paint. Rick has also done work for film and television, as well as special effects. In fact, he was Keanu Reeves' digital stunt double in the motion picture Johnny Mnemonic. Rick originally learned how to draw from comic books, book covers, and collaborations with other artists. He also creates original paintings for galleries, illustration projects, private clients, and theatrical performances. Barry's work has appeared in many science fiction and fantasy novels, as well as comic books and graphic novels, including Neil Gaiman's Sandman and HBO series Anansi Boys. Rick's work can also be found featured on Magic the Gathering Cards, also paintings for authors such as Stephen King, George Martin, and William Gibson novels. Also, here's a fun fact about Rick Barry. Rick created the first digitally painted book cover worldwide for William Gibson's Neuromancer. And today we're taking a deep dive into his creative process and the frontiers he's navigating in the paint. So let's get into it. Welcome, Rick. Hey, how you doing, Garrett? Thanks so much for being on the show. The reason why I knew you would be an amazing guest is because the vast majority of people in the world do not know how art is made. And it's a goal of mine to increase consciousness around the process of creating and producing art. So I always like to kick off the show with an origin story. What was the aha moment? What was the spark that brought you to choose art and painting as your discipline? And how did painting grow personal meaning for you from day one to now? Uh, I think the, the aha moment and the choice are distant from one another in time. Um, so much so it makes the choice thing kind of questionable. The aha moment was probably finger painting in kindergarten, something like that. Mm -hmm. And the, just the liveness of being there, having this magical thing just explode before your eyes, was done without any awareness of choice, in as much as choice usually is about how you're going to fit yourself into the world, I'm going to make this my calling card, this, that, and the other. And that's a very social sort of thing, how you can make a living. The aha moment had already occurred long before the choice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the choice was kind of almost a sense of not having made it at all, as if the aha moment had chosen me a long time ago. <laughs> and and the, the thing that appeared to be a choice was simply waking up to the fact of something already established. This was what I was doing, this was what I always was doing, and I was never going to not be able to do it. So mm -hmm. it was uh, kind of on rails at that point. Mm, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. So let's get into your art and the creative process behind how you think while you're painting and the frontiers that you're navigating in the paint. I know from experience jamming with you in your old studio many years ago that you view a painting as something organic and can evolve indefinitely and can and should at times be reworked. Whereas traditionally, the majority believes that when a painting is finished, it's finished. Here today, we have a series of your work where you've captured your paintings throughout their various stages of completion. So Rick, other than being an impressionist painter, have you ever given your style a name or a nickname? Mm, wow. Yeah, I probably haven't. Um, I think that if it could be sort of shoehorned into things, it would be expressionism and impressionism and some isms that are floating about. I don't know if those things inherently state for themselves as movements the kind of thing I intend. But for me, it's a case of inventionism, really. I, I am exploring. I'm navigating and kind of pathfinding using paint as a way to see, as a, as a sort of a graphical feedback loop which promotes visual thinking. I'm not sure what name one would use for that. The, the book that I, here's, here's, a, here's an obvious shot at a plug. The, la, the last book I did was nice, called nice. Invented People. It's two things. 
it's one it's using it's using art to see with but it's also using art to speculate with so there isn't this sense of knowing exactly where i'm going when i take off there is sort of a sense of knowing exactly what i'm doing and I mean, if, if you're trucking through the forest and you're sort of blazing a trail or, or you're searching and things like that, you know what you're doing. What is a goal is emergent in the process. The other thing is, you mentioned earlier, the, the notion of, of completion and finish and, and that sort of thing. I, I find finish to be a, uh, a falsehood, really. It's just not true. It's not true of anything in the world that I can tell. I can't see a single finished thing when I look out. Um, Everything is always changing. Uh, it's either growing or decaying or shifting or transforming. The idea of trying to come up with a convincing picture that includes this more artificial notion of finished, they just don't jive for me. If the thing doesn't look like it's still happening, it's not working. And so I'm not a big fan of finish. I, I think that it is, finished paintings really are finished in a way to me there in, in as much as they are sort of finite and more of them a thing that looks like it's still kind of happening still occurring that's a much harder subject to pursue you know something is sort of uh, you come back to it and you go wait was, is that the same as when I last looked at it and you know intellectually it must be it's just colored paste on a board what is a painting is something that is only really pursued as a dynamic neurological process of perception. The board's a board, the paste is a paste, the colored paint is, you know, it is what it is. But can you code? Is your mastery developed around the notion of how people actually see? And I mean, seeing is a very complex, amazing sub, you know, a lot of cognitive components to that, that kind of seeing. If you understand well how people see, or you think that how you see is shared with how other people see, and you do something on a board that makes you feel as if the thing is still occurring, still cooking somehow, and you go, oh man, I'm, I'm alive at this moment, I'm going to let this painting go, that's about as close as I get to a finish. It's not really a case of like, uh, well, when it is a case of me buttoning everything down, when I tie every shoelace, I dot every I, and cross every T, I wind up with one of those paintings that might be admired for some of the skill apparent in it, and people not knowing what I know, which is that it looked really good two sittings ago and now it looks dead <laughs> and but it's finished all right but people kind of go oh that's really nice it's it's a it's a pretty object and i go yeah i think i screwed up but the nice thing about having digital files or records of what you do being able to shoot mid states as you go is also the painful thing and that is that i will often <laughs> look at a painting that i shot two sessions before and i go well there's where it, you know that was it man you just blew right by it and you finished it so so I became deeply suspicious of the concept of finish at all and that it really was a painful thing to wind up with a, in quotes, finished painting. Paintings that really looked alive to me, there was this sort of real sense of imminence to them. And that in itself implies that something is happening. Not has happened, it's still happening and is going to happen. If I can capture that, then I think I'm approaching what I think of as that deeper mastery of how we actually see in time, how we actually, um, how our perception actually works. It's not some little button down, tidied up, you know, it's not neat. Kino, oh, here's my little object of a painting. I've done those, and some of them are pretty, some of them are fine. They're not nearly as satisfying or as exciting as those things that don't even bother with finish. Awesome. Hey, let's grab a question from the audience. First up, we have Christina calling in from Sweden. Welcome, Christina. What's your question for Rick? Hi, Rick. I hope you're doing well, and you're enjoying your talk with Garrett. Now, uh, humans have been having conversations, but also mark making, drawing, probably throughout our entire existence, and it seems the way that we all communicate. And my question to you is, when you sit down in front of the easel, do you know what it is you want to communicate uh, from the start, what you want to say, or do you let that come on its own, like the marks and the works themselves? Uh, perhaps like an open-ended discussion or an interview. Uh, Christina, by the way, uh, from my own personal experience, I know to be a simply 
fabulous artist. Mm. One, one of the very best artists I've ever met. So I am honored that she should be interested enough to sort of float a question at me. Um, it's one of those odd answers that says yes to the, is it this or that? It says yes to both of them. Um, I do sort of really have a clear idea of what I'm doing. It's as if I have instituted a kind of behavior, visual behavior, that I know gives rise to certain kinds of searches. And I can point it quite directly. I mean, I can even point it illustrationally if I need to. I mean, if I need to paint a wolf, I can, I can start making marks that will beget a wolf. It will, in fact, probably spoil me for choice in as much as there will be several different wolves to pick from and postures and movements. And then I'll have to settle down and edit back to that, but there is a kindedness to the scribble that I start using. And a kinded scribble is something that I, I would really like to put across to people. It's scribble that has characteristics. It's, if it's more angular, uh, if, it's, it has, if it inherently has more acute angles or it has more uh, right angles and overlapping, if those scribbles vanish to a point, then what I have started to do is draw architecture. It's a scribble for architecture and before any given window or door appears there is just the drawing of architectural mess and it just flows over the board and it starts to trigger a recognition reflex this is sort of what i mean in, when i sort of say in the book uh, that you have you have you can't worry about making mistakes you just have to make a lot of interesting marks and then discover what you didn't know you knew if i just set out and said well this building has to have a window and this building has to have a door and it's got to go right here and i'd sort of calculate it and measure it and do all that sort of stuff you can get there that way but it's less discovery and more using art as a discipline to render from a pre-existing notion. Mm -hmm. I find the discovery path far richer, much, much richer. I, again, I'm spoiled for choice. What doors do I want? What street and avenue do I want out of this? Uh, what kind of roofs? Do I want gabled roofs? Do I want finials from uh, an Asian temple? Do I, you know, and I can just impart that to the scribble. The scribble will generate these options for me. And then I carve back against it. Um, the, one of the most difficult things is having that being spoiled for choice, having to refuse things that you go, man, that's just so cool, but I've got no reason to have it in this picture right now. It has to be another painting somewhere else down the road, and I have to get rid of it because it's becoming internally competitive. Then your next step is to really say, okay, what is good seeing after this morass of stuff has happened, and how can I clean this up in an elegant fashion and make it punchy and stronger? So the answer is, yes, I have a clear idea of how to proceed, and I even have a pretty good idea of kindness, what must occur there. But I don't go into specific goals too quickly, because sometimes things present in that mode that are far better than if I sat down with a laundry list of things that had to be in the picture, and then just made sure all of them were there. That often turns out to be uh, well, a very arid exercise, and it shows up in the picture. It just looks too calculated. It doesn't look as if it, well, as I mentioned earlier, it doesn't look as if it happened. The time thing uh, is interesting. Knowing ahead and, and whether or not you knew in advance what was going to occur more specifically is a bigger question about time itself and my I'm a I'm a science reader hack and there really isn't a lot of support for for time as anything but an expression of perspective at least in quantum physics um, the idea that that I almost could have the future back propagating into making my actions in the present determine things is an interesting sort of question where you kind of go did I know where I was going all along was I already where I was going all along but I mean that's going to sound corny and flaky if just sort of shoved in here but it's I just want to footnote that in there as some of the speculation that I undergo while drawing and while painting is that sense that uh, this this isn't what what appears to me here and now often provokes the sense of especially with all those alternatives built into it 
all these sort of branching pathways of things that are already there. That, that sense of finding out what you didn't know you knew is sort of complicates her question in terms, or complicates the answer. Because when I do do something that way, I do depend on recognition. I do know it. I, this does feel goal-like. And yet I had to use this visual approach to discover what it is I meant. I'm literally thinking in the art. Some people might think I need to do this before drawing. And you can say they have a goal. They know where they're going. But what if your thinking is simply the mark making itself? Isn't that also thinking about where you're going? And when you arrive there, did you know what you wanted? Well, yeah, I did. Because I went, I want that. You know some of this stuff yourself, Garrett. I I've seen you paint. I've seen that exploratory reach. Absolutely. I feel the same way when I paint. And this is why I love our genre of painting. Thanks, Christina, for your question. So, Rick, let's chat more from your POV of being an impressionist painter and the challenge of navigating new and uncertain terrain. An example being, for some, this could mean artist block or falling out of the flow state. So what are some obstacles that you frequently face while painting and how do you overcome them? Oh, uh, artist block. I don't really know that that ever happens to me. Uh, partly because you know, I may have actually let myself off the hook in a wonderful way without realizing it since just the action of doing art is provoked by mark making you don't necessarily have to even feel like making art to start making art at least not in the way i do it if i am you know i'll have a student sometimes you know uh, private students they'll they'll contact me and ask if they can take lessons I'll, mm -hmm. make a, I'll make a little program or whatever but one of the first things we do is we'll set up surfaces and i'll say uh, okay so cover that with paint and they'll kind of go uh really i say yeah yeah just just cover it with paint get get a big chunk of paint on there cover the whole damn thing and there is this sort of bias that you're supposed to know where the paint's supposed to go beforehand and I think that's where block occurs for most people. Mm -hmm. I, I need to know beforehand where I'm supposed to put the paint so that it'll look good. And you have all this, this preponderance of, of possibilities, judgment, uh, correctness, right, wrong, uh, what it's supposed to be in the way of starting the damn painting. But if in fact you've started the damn painting with a bunch of paint and just loaded it on, and, and what I usually say to my students then is, you know, you can't really paint without paint. So load it on there, and then we'll start moving it around. There's an involvement that occurs, much like that sort of uh, finger painting child. You load that paint on there, and you start moving it around. The part of your mind that's filled with those questions about whether or not you're doing the right thing or the wrong thing that originates that sense of artist block, that's not involved in this. You've stepped right past it. What you're doing now is shoving paint around. Maybe you turn the music up louder, and you start to find a neurocognitive process gets engaged with moving that paint around that has nothing to do with those questions. It just starts moving them around. It's a job. It's physical action. It's something occurring before your eyes. And it starts to arrest that part of your mind that actually does art. Not the part of your mind that is actually deciding whether or not you're doing the right thing. It That is no longer relevant. This part of your, this neurocognitive complex, which allows you to sort of navigate and pathfind in order to think, has taken over. Then you start going, well, that mark is okay, but I don't really need that one. I don't need all this paint over here. I'm just going to carve that back because I like this shape and I'm going to scoop in and support that shape and pretty soon you're doing art and things are evolved. Now if you combine this with the idea of kinded scribble you can lay that paint down and also scribble like a child just the same way the paint was laid down. You can start scribbling into it. You can you can subtractively scribble with some skier or some mark maker that removes paint. Swing it around and then re-blend it out. Oh, well that I didn't want that mark. I'll just blend that one out. And say, these are kind of cool and then you start saying well actually I need more angles like this, banishing that terrain, and you just start blowing those marks one through the other, you're already involved in a kind of visual engagement that, again, has moved you well past any psychological block. It's kind of fabulous. The further reaches of this evolve into something we could probably get to further down the road here, which is that's the visual neurocognitive process of being in mode, in the language of visual thinking. The, the step beyond that, of course, is what do you want to say? And that's a very psychological and emotional step quite apart from any previous mention of psychological block this is more goal this is more emergent goal how do you feel as you make the marks and what occurs but that's that's another larger question
the first question though of, of sidestepping block or those difficulties I think is best answered by get in there start making the marks thoughtlessly fill it in scribble like a child get engaged in the medium it is a medium and it is a medium of thought start doing that you're in the wrong medium of thought if you're preconceiving success let's talk more about that medium the medium of oil paint itself oil painting is not for everyone and many artists are curious about working with oils meanwhile some are terrified of making a mistake because the classical method of learning how to oil paint can be extremely complex so here's a question for the young aspiring artists who are listening, who may be in art school right now. This is a question that I would have asked when I was 16, 17, 18 years old. How did you practice? And what steps did you follow in your earliest years that taught you how to control drawing and painting? I'm sure I made many missteps and had many fantastic disasters, but to clean it up a bit, what I would distill out of those disasters and try and simplify here is that I would point out that oil paint is a marvelous drawing medium. And most people are familiar with a uh, kind of drawing ahead of actual big paint, unless of course they're splurging around the watercolors, which is a wonderful arena to make big images. And then you can draw on top of the watercolor and you can do the same thing with oil paint. But it might help people to realize that you can sort of set up a receiver glaze, a medium, have a wet surface, a la sort of like Bob Ross, who I love. <laughs> You know, you just have something that's wet and live. Now, Bob just goes step by step and, and sort of does a uh, kind of a Confucianist rigor of do this, then that, then this. I don't really have those kinds of steps, but I do sort of enjoy having a very live surface that I can sketch on. In fact, my sketches for oil paintings do exist. They're just in the oil paint. They're already there. It's those sketches that I'm going to overrun live. Mm -hmm. I, when I sketch for like sketchbook stuff, those are to me considered their own art form. I have tons of sketchbooks, but I never take any of them and turn them into paintings uh, or very rarely. And that's usually by request. Someone will say a sketch, can you turn this into a painting? And I'll say, well, I can try. And you know, then I sell it's, it's very unlike me to do that. So I draw and sketch in the paint. Now the thing is just have it be forgiving, have it be slick enough that you can wipe away rapid erasures with a rag or anything you care to use and remark it. Oil paint is beautiful for that. And then the nice thing is that those line drawings quickly shift over into field effects as soon as you hit them with anything and blurs them. Suddenly a field effect is starting to fill in an area, not just a linear thing. It's starting to kind of portend volumes and light and shadow, and that's pretty cool. And you can make that sketch evolve towards that by just sort of adding and blurring and shifting things about. All of this sounds a lot like that finger paint analogy. And it is a lot like it. It's just as you get better at these things, they become more um, sophisticated in appearance. When I was a kid, when I was a child, I, I saw a big ribbon like multicolored highways, you know, shooting through stars that were water spattered on a piece of paper. And I was amazed at how easy art seemed. This should be almost that easy, except that you have other ideas about what you want to derive from it. And you can predispose the board to give you those things. That whole idea of being able to predispose the board is, again, going back to that, that scribble and paint to push around. Have something there to work with before you try and choose what you're doing. Choose in the paint to do what you want. Don't pre-choose and then try and get the paint crabbedly, to, you know, in a crabwise way to sort of follow what you think it must be. That will always look stiff and over-calculated. Oil allows you to be loose, so go ahead and be loose with it. You can always edit back against it later. That's the beauty of oil. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Love it. Okay, let's talk about archiving and indexing one's body of work. How important is it that artists properly catalog their work? And how do you archive your creations? I think a great archive would be a dumpster fire. I got to tell you, <laughs> no, I, for, I don't know if this is really a, a proper problem or, or, or is is universal enough for people to identify with it so generalizing out of my own experience may not be terribly useful but I paint a lot I mean a lot and I have done so much art I don't you know archiving is almost uh, it's almost hopeless for me mm -hmm. however digital record for archive gives you something of a handle 
on the problem. But if you want to hang on to physical paintings and, and get them all sort of categorized and properly stowed and everything like that, that's just an agonizing labor that I do engage in, but it is really painful. I have shelves and shelves of things that are just notional and, and because they're notional, they're very interesting. I don't want to throw them out. And I have, I have other things that are more precious and have to be looked after in a certain way. And I have flat files, you know, a couple stacks of and full of drawings and what have you. What I have learned is that you mustn't be too attached. You know, you are on a journey and the paintings, paintings often for me, once they're, once they've sort of answered some questions for me and have done what I think they can do, uh, I'm on to another painting and I care way less about their physical well-being than the people around me do. Um, and there are people around me who really do care about that and are exasperated <laughs> because they kind of go, oh my God, did you, what the, did you take, what the hell? What, did you just lean something up against that painting? Mm -hmm. And I went, oh yeah, I guess I kind of did. And it is problematic when you are a husband and a father and you have a living to make if you don't look after the things that make you money. So selling paintings is best done when the paintings are looked after. So it is a tough thing to do if you do a whole lot of painting, which I do do. If I did just a few paintings a year, or if I was uh, someone who had a more programmatic notion of a brand, I have a branded look, I always do this kind of painting, I'm known for this sort of output, they're always going to be, you know, pinups or something, um, that would be easier. That would be easier overall. That's a much more controllable and concise idea of making a living as a kind of artist. However, I've never had that concision. I've never had that idea. Um, my, since I just explore all the time, I wind up with a lot of hazardous paint waste. <laughs> just a lot of stuff lying around, I get it. I get it. just waiting to explode. And, and I, it's, it's not that this doesn't work out. I mean, there are times when I've absolutely given up on a painting, or I think to myself, I have no idea what to do with this thing now. That it can take me as much as a year or more to actually sort of understand what was going on there, why I was intrigued by it, but didn't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when a painting is interestingly destroyed, and this became a big part of how I did art later on, when I get really frustrated with things that are just lying around, fucking I don't need this thing here anymore. And I can go, well, at least it's a prepared surface. I'll just knock some paint over it and I won't have to prepare another surface because I don't give it to, and you know, believe me, my, my beloved, my wife, at times is furious with me about painting over paintings she liked. But I have noticed when I'm not in trouble that on those occasions that I get away with this, I will, I will like lay paint all over a pre-existing, maybe overly academic, exercise in anatomy or something that I kind of go been there done that I've seen this before I really don't care about this piece and yeah it is sellable but I just don't want it lying around and it's annoying so I will paint over it and I will do as I said before I will start as if I'm starting all over again and I will just lay big swaths of paint over it but what has occurred in that destruction at times that I see things start to happen as I stress the painting what happens is that in its destruction, the grip it had on me prior is loosened. That it's no longer has good purchase in my mind, especially like a bad tune that's in your head that you can't stop humming. That's been destroyed by this destruction. However, there are still things fragmentary and fissure-like floating around that re-trigger what may have been the original impulse that had gone south. And I have now started to employ it as a technique. I'll do a fairly, I don't know, conventional trope, figurative trope, and, and and I invent my figures. I don't use models, I don't use photography, I don't use references. Right. So I, I'll just, I'll be swinging around and I'll do this cartoon and it's, you know, it's kind of fun, it's all right. I enjoy it well enough. And I'll do it in a siccative oil paint, like uh, raw umber, it dries very quickly. The next day I can come to that and I can just plow it under and then using really broad, terrible tools, scrape at it, move paint off of it, leave parts of it obscured, and that almost invariably loosens me up because now I've left the confines of what I consciously know. And what I mean by consciously know, I know how to make a figure, I know how to make an arm, I know how to make an head. You know, I do that and it's all 
too finite. It's all too, like, I already knew that. I'm not very interested. But when I destroy it, there's something in me that gets re-engaged with the whole notion of figurative work or whatever it may be. It could be buildings, it could be whatever. But it gets involved with it again. But it isn't what I planned to do in the ordinary sense. I'm now pathfinding. I've broken up my sense of what I know. And the only way out of it is to discover what I didn't know I knew. In other words, trigger that recognition reflex. If you think about it, every day you go and you walk out on a street and there's things you know about that street. Well, actually, this is an answer to another question, so I'm gonna leave that to the side. That's more about convincingness of reality. Um, but you trigger this Darwinistic need to make sense of what's in front of you because you've destroyed what you thought you knew. It's no longer a secure place. You're slightly insecure in a good way. You must now react. You must now act and do something about what's in front of you. Your energies come up, your focus sharpens, and you see new things, unexpected things, because of the happenstance of wrecking this painting. And you start going, this wreckage is very, very interesting to me. Maybe it is that other question. This wreckage is, is is very interesting to me in as much as it's starting to convince me more that it's actually happened. And the reason that is, is because reality always presents that way. Reality presents you with something that you know, and then inevitably, if you look down the street long enough, there are things you don't know. I don't know what that is down there. I can't quite tell. Every picture of reality, if it's big enough, will include things that you don't quite recognize or have failed to acknowledge. And that makes it realer. If it is all explained, if everything makes sense, that is less real. So if you really want a picture that grabs you, feels convincing, feels like reality, you should blow it up and see how the fragments fall. Deal with what you can, but also leave in it that sense of another secret bloom of dimension occurring in the surface. And boy, does that click. And that's quite the chase. You know, you can lose it. You know, it, you, it's like surfing an idea. You can you can wipe out. You can go, kind of, well, that was really beautiful for about five minutes there before I really wrecked it. But it's worth the chase. I love the perspective of destruction as a creative device. Let's talk about, you know, I've heard that you have a photographic memory. Is this true? Uh, I don't know if I would. Well, uh, certainly a very good one. Vis is a very good, a very strong visual memory. The thing, the problem with memory, see, this this brings up the. We have to go a little further back in that question because there's the problem with memory itself. There's a lot of cognitive work on what memory is, and it turns out that memory is mostly a story that we make up and and we find useful for making sense of our world and i've you've seen people argue about remembering things different and they were both at the same event and they saw two different things and their recall is quite different so memory is obviously a dynamic motile thing in the mind photographic memory doesn't shake the the uh, the compounding effect of the original problem with memory. It's still there. We see what we are inclined to see. Now, when it comes to figurative work, we're very inclined to see figures. We're very inclined to see faces. In fact, the reason anatomy is, I think, considered uh, so demanding is that you don't have to be an artist to look at a figure and say it convinces you or doesn't convince you because you already have a built-in expert system quite without training. We're, we're trained in a Darwinistic sense. Uh, we have circuitry that recognizes whether or not someone's angry or someone's happy. If, if there's an imminent threat in the posture of a given figure or if someone is dancing and glad, we just, we nail it right away and with no art training. So this resident expert system is always there, always available to us. Now some of us, and, and we have to count on this as artists because if other people don't have it, they don't see our pictures. You have to remember that you your picture requires someone using a talent very similar to the one you use to make the picture with in order to even see it. If someone else looks at it, they're using something like what the artist used to make it. This is in all of us. Now the discipline of art can be how do I tap those circuits and get them to click for me. And my method, as I sort of said earlier, is to trigger it. I literally use art to think with. I use marks to trigger those things. And of course, one of the expert systems to hand is figurative. It's super demanding, yes, because it will be measured more adequately by the audience than almost anything else. I mean, a landscape can have any sort of 
proportion. It can run these ways, it can run that way. This rock can be bigger, it can be smaller. But you do that with a figure and people go, man, you really have a problem with your proportions. Or man, you know, you know see what I'm seeing? Uh, basically, we have a built-in expert system whereby that work will be held to a higher standard because of that expert system. So if someone's really good at figurative work, that's considered to be kind of sharp. You know, you must be pretty pretty clever-handed. You must have good eyes. And yeah, that's true, probably. But I also am relying on that expert system, which gives me a leg up on the same problem. And if I have a ready access to it, because I do see people very well, and I can trigger it via the methods I use, then the figures come out pretty hot. It's not as if I'm actually working without reference, even when I say I don't use models and I don't use photography. There is the expert system itself, which is the reference, and I just need access to it, and I have a way of getting there. Speaking of books, you released a book recently called Invented People. Let's throw a link in here for anyone interested in buying a copy for themselves. Um, tell us about the book and what went into selecting the paintings that made the cut. Oh my gosh. Uh, well, two things. That's a, that's a compound question. I'll, I'll deal with the second part first, if I may. What made the cut? Well, the cut was never really quite finished. The book itself is um, it's like 48 color pieces and that's about the size of the book it's 9 by 12 I think softbound and when the publisher was talking with me about doing an art book originally we were talking a big coffee table style art book you know heavy big fabric covers you know 60 bucks to buy it 80 bucks you know a big ass book and sort of oh what would you say a comprehensive kind of thing I just and I you know it sounds flattering and it sounds nice it sounds cool and Yet, I don't think of coffee table books as being terribly useful, at least not to the artist I was. When I was a kid, and I, you know, like I said, I have no formal training whatsoever. So access to art in Colorado Springs, which was a, was a cultural desert back then, comic book stands and Kmart book racks were where I could walk, I mean, I could, I could walk away with a comic book and it was like for 25 cents back then, I had a battery pack of art. It, and it meant so much to me. Yeah. I mean, obviously yeah. it did. I mean, I learned to draw and cartoon and, and be stimulated by all these things that I could get access to. This wasn't a museum, this wasn't a gallery. This was 25 cents and I walked away with a chunk of buzzing, fizzing art. And I began to rethink the whole business of my art book. And I went, well, who, what would I want this thing to serve? What Can it be afforded by the kind of kid I was? And this big coffee table thing can't be. So let's make it in volumes. And I talked to my publisher about this. I, I even forced my publisher to come up with a new imprint for uh, Donald M. Grant. It's called Vienna Books, and it's dedicated solely to art books. And cool. I, I had to persuade him. <laughs> and, and so Donald M. Grant Publishers created Vienna Books for publishing this book and ostensibly others to follow. So this is volume one of Invented People and that really eased the pressure on me about making a cut. What I did have was a book that was affordable that anyone could buy. They could buy the volume they're interested in and maybe they're not interested in the second volume or maybe they are, but they can wait for it and afford it then. And if we get four of them, we can box them and a collector can buy all four in a box set and so on and so forth. It seemed a way of tuning access to need. And I couldn't forget that kid that I was and how, I mean, art felt like it saved my life. I was a young punk who had been to, by the time I left school, I was 17, I left home. And uh, I went to 11 different schools and I never graduated. I'm a high school dropout. I mean, this is back during Vietnam. I just didn't think I had a lot of time and I wanted to get on with living. And we moved so much that school had become just, uh, just a, a horror show for me. The movable feast in my life, the thing I could always take with me with the disappearance of neighborhoods, the disappearance of friends, was art. Art was something that was portable, it was in your notebook, it's what you could do. And that's why comic books and access to art was a huge, huge thing because it was ubiquitous, it was everywhere and I could get to it. So the idea of not leaving that particular art buyer that young artist behind by making a big coffee table book was important to me. So that's what I did and will continue to do. 
So the cut for that book is the cut for that book, but the cut is not finished. There will be another volume and another volume after that. The next one I think is going to be electropop. It'll be heavily digitally influenced, a lot of buzzy stuff that I do in there. And it will be more invented people. Now, the first part of the question we can get onto, invented people itself. Um, it will ably enough, I think, demonstrate that yeah, you can magic up figurative work via the methods I've talked about earlier. But there's the far end of the goal, and that's the psychological end. You're looking at something that after a while looks less and less like a cartoon and more and more like a person, more and more like a presence. You're zeroing in on something, and what may have started out as merely an academic problem, like I want to compress ribs on one side of a rib cage, and I want to expand ribs on the other side of the rib cage, and I want to figure out how that works, and I start scribbling, making lines to do that very thing. But after a while, it starts to turn into something much more than an exploration of function and design. Uh, I have a painting called uh, Magdalene that is, is really, it's almost a scary painting. But the psychological gravitas of this figure starts to move into place. When you start to convince yourself you're looking at a real thing, there's all sorts of emotional attachment that starts to shove into view, starts to guide your hand. You start to see something significant. It's, it's no longer it's no longer just about whether or not you're clever-handed, it's about how you feel about what you're looking at. And then your hand starts to support that. So they're not just invented figures, they're invented people. And that carries a certain gravitas with this. This is an emotional landscape that lives inside of me. And is these, these paintings are triggering in me. Wow. Let's tap into your digital art. What was the status quo around the time when you created the first digitally painted book cover worldwide for William Gibson's Neuromancer? And what motivated you to become an early adopter of creative technology? Okay, um, I'm going to throw in a, a, a brief note here about being the first digitally created art cover. I think that honor may actually belong to Barbara Nassim, N-E-S-S-I-M. However, mine is the first, I think, cover for a novel in the world, digital novel, D digital cover for a novel. Um, I, someone told me that Nassim had done this and she's such a notable artist and, and so good in her own way that I would, I would hate to be appearing to steal her thunder. In, in 1984, the digital art was, well, it, it was very outre, almost nobody knew about it. And I had been following it. I, I like David M's work, E.M. by the way. David M was using, I think, uh, JPL, um, you know, NASA software for flyby simulations in, in the solar system. This software was created by Steve Blinn and, and he lent it to David M and David M started doing all these fantastic surreal landscapes and whatnot. It's fantastic stuff. But, but getting out to the commercial surface, to the public surface with digital art is um, why why in 1984 it was considered so unusual because this this is really this is the caveman era of digital art and so and and for no less a book than william gibson's neuromancer which is like heart and soul the same beat it's the the, the dawning of cyberpunk and i <laughs> i've always been interested obviously in how to make a new picture I, I, an interesting new kind of picture anything anything you can make a picture with I'm interested in trying to use it to make a picture. And I had been following, being a cyberpunk kind of science fiction soul, I, I was following digital art as a big thing to try and do. As it happened, I was at Berkeley Books and Gibson's Neuromancer uh, was, was all the talk there. And I think I was there picking up a painting or dropping off a painting for a book cover. And they had an extraordinarily charming habit of kissing off a really bad day or a rough day at Berkeley by picking some editor's office, apparently random, 
ordering up some magnums of champagne and then all the editors would flow into that office at the end of the day and they'd sit around the edge of the room and they'd kill that bottle of champagne <laughs> <laughs> and i was i just happened to be there and for some reason i was actually in the editor's desk chair i was the only one who had a chair and and, and in this room is no less than the, the vice president of berkeley books and and so they're all sitting around there and they're and for whatever reason, the champagne's really kicking in. I'm starting to tell cowboy stories from out west, you know, <laughs> stupid ass things that I did as a kid, like uh, cowboying up in Montana and, and uh, what have you. And then the the VP says, "What are we going to do about Gibson's book?" They start talking, and of course, I've I've read the book, Neuromancer, and it has. And they said, "Well, we need a new cover," and it had a cover, a very a very competent cover by uh, James Warhola. But the reason they were going to put a new cover on it is they had become aware that it was going to sweep the awards. It was going to win the Campbell, it was going to win the Nebula, it was going to win the Hugos. So it was the next big thing. So they wanted to do a new cover for it. And I said, why, what do you think about it? And she said, I'm, we're thinking about computer art, which is what they called it back then. Right. And, and I went, uh, oh, you know, I, and I'm drunk as a skunk at this point. And I go, oh, I can do that for you. <laughs> I'm from Boston. You know, Boston's one of the computer art, one of the computer capitals of the world. Yes, and so, yes. so I get back home <laughs> and I have a terrible, terrible hangover. And I'm thinking, have I just been lying to my biggest client? And how can I make my lies come true? So I examined the lie really carefully. I said, well, Boston is one of the digital capitals of the world. I should be able to do something. I don't own a computer, but wait, what can I do? So I go to MIT and I talk my way into the media arts building there. And there have these crypto locks on the doors. And I'm looking, I think, for Muriel Cooper's visual language workshop. I figured that's got to be a place where you can make computer art. I'm just going to have to do a song and dance really fast and persuade them to help me out. And I meet this very kindly janitor and I I'm dressed to the nines, so I, so no one will throw me out. I have my folio of eight by ten black and whites and color fo photos of my artwork, and under my arm, and and he he lets me in. The crypto locks are worked, and I can go in. And I'm not in visual language workshop at all. I'm in a far more powerful outfit called the Architectural Machine Group, and they have these two huge Ramtech mainframes, and they have a bunch of Spark stations floating around the room young hackers in there and they're doing what will become the, the the beginning of war games that are in gaming technology but this is a swiss program called trillium that they're working on and you have this sort of me and bizarro cubistic world which have farms and peasants and fields being run over by tanks and being exploded and what have you and, and it's all high-end shit and I explained to the hackers in there that I've been lying and I need somehow to make my lies come true. <laughs> and a young hacker named Mike Holly, and he appears in Stuart Brand's book on um, on the Media Lab, on the Media Arts Lab building. Uh, and Mike Holly's in there. There's a photograph of him using a force feedback controller of some sort. But it's this young guy, and and I'm a young guy, and he says, uh, "Oh." Shit, I see. Well, look, could we just false map your artwork? And I said, that would be fine. That'd be great. Let's do that. You know? Cool. cool. And, and so they scan and they throw it in there. And he says, didn't, didn't Albert have some sort of program that would do this? And Mike says, I can break into Albert's program. And they do it. So they make these, these things. And uh, I have to come back in 15 hours, you know. Well, about 15 hours go by, but I have to come back because everyone goes for a dinner break and I leave and I talk my way back in and I, I get there and about 15 hours later I have all these big glossy 8x10s of wildly false mapped images that I had made previously. And Mike actually asks, um, I'm wondering, man, uh, how, like, you know, how did you get in here? Now they're all in t-shirts and cutoffs and sneakers and stuff, these hackers. And I've got a tie and a sport coat on. <laughs> and, 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 I, and I say, well, they just let me in. He said, God, you know, they challenge us every time. And I went, well, you know, thinking to myself, maybe it's how you're dressed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I got in and out of that place. I sent the images off. And the vice president says, well, where are the big blocky thing? And I go, you mean 
the pixels? She said, yeah, how are they going to know it's computer art if they don't see big blocky things? And they went, oh my <laughs> god, it's too slick, it's too sophisticated. So I went back to Mass Art, which had a far more primitive lab, and I did exactly the same thing over again. Right, Talked right. my way in, they had an Apple IIGS, they had a Polaroid palette outputter, and I took a red chalk drawing of mine, shoved it through the whole process, and now it was full of big blocky things, so much so that it was nearly unrecognizable. And I went, all right, that's a problem. So I went to Noman Copy, had them give me a Ciba chrome of the whole thing, doped it for oil paint, and now the older medium would be responsible for making the newer medium look sophisticated enough so that you could recognize what the hell was there. And that was the first book cover, a transition piece between old and new with the old doing the sophisticated part and the new being the big blocky stuff that made it a computer art. And then I took the money from that assignment, went out and bought myself an Atari 520ST, and I did the next two Gibson book covers on that. I love that. I heard Bill bought a computer himself from his first, from Neuromancer. He didn't have one either. And it's all about digital anarchy, isn't it? And social upheaval, and and it's about the coming of the digital cyberpunk age. Yet he, he just like me, took his money from that same book and went out and bought his first computer, just like I did. <laughs> That's incredible, man. That is probably the most interesting story about creating digital art that I've heard because there are so many moving parts to it. And I don't know how many digital artists today can recall that process of discovery because we have everything immediately available at our fingertips today. Speaking more on digital art, what are your thoughts on NFTs and cryptocurrencies? Have you dived into this new frontier? No, I have not. Um, I am curious about it. I'm 68 now, though. Mm -hmm. and, and it's it's less a question of slowing down, though there's probably certainly that. But it's become a question of... I mean, art is kind of an athletic enterprise, if you think about it. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it, you, you have to have stamina, and you have to have cognitive stamina as well and my eyes aren't nearly as good as they were I mean I I don't see well um, I see quite well in terms of painting but when it comes down to just the mechanics of you know resolved focused camera work in the eyeball it's not very good and my my hand steadiness is you know not what it was and in fact, I even have arthritis in my spine. So the, the, my, the, the first three tips of my fingers, my thumb, index, and middle finger on both hands, they're numb at the tips. So it's difficult for me to actually sense brush pressure like I once did. Mm. And I drop mm. things. It's just, it's just weird. It's just equipment failure. However, the sharpness of what I see has gone way, way up mentally and with these sorts of harbingers on my ass about eventual mortality i think to myself i really want to get a few first class things done before i can't and there are various frontiers opening up all the time and they're well worth exploring and the idea of having an nft digital original for sale is certainly intriguing i would like some really smart assistant to help me with that because I do not want to explore it because what I want to do is get some things done that I can do and I really feel as if I haven't quite pushed it as far as I could. So the oil paintings and the digital work that I'm doing now are, are consuming me. They completely consume me. I, I don't have time to explore those other things because these things, which are quite bottomless, I sense there's more in that well for me to pull up. And I've got to do it while I can. Most definitely. And you know what? When you're ready, when that time comes, just hit me up. I'll get you set up with your NFTs and crypto. I got you, man. Oh, hey, 
he's, you're a sweetheart. I, you, you, you said he's the wrong guy, though, because I'll probably take you up on it. Good, good, good. I hope you do. Now, continuing on, let's talk about creative projects. What was your first paid project? And what was your age at the time? And how did it make you feel about your career moving forward? Okay, yeah, huh. That, yeah, that's, I don't know, it's, it's vague. <laughs> it's a long, it's a long, time, long ago, time, time ago, ago now. Uh, well, I, re I remember things I did. I remember we, we start, I, I wasn't a solo act by any means. I was part of a, uh, a studio that was fully made of half of high school dropouts and half of honor students. The, we, we were like an inverted bell curve. You know, you have you have the D's and F's high on the curve over here. You have almost no C's or average people's down in the middle at the bottom of the curve. And then you have the A's and B's on the other end of the curve high. And these were the guys who were associating one another. The 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 broad the broad that is normally at the top of the curve, average, wasn't there. The the miscreant and the highfalutin were associating with one another. And that was our studio. And we did underground comics and magazines and, and flyers and newspapers. And somewhere in there, we migrated towards professionalism. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that uh, our, I remember, you know, harem scarum trips down to Penrose, Colorado uh, to use the off time press for the local newspaper there. And we're busy. I was the driver typically. I don't think Artie Romero trusted me to do strip up on the big plate negative stuffs and the, and things like that because I was too uh, I was too reckless. And but him and Daryl Anderson and I would be flying in a van down to this press, and we would literally see their graphic arts camera, take our pay stubs, turn them into plate negatives. We would work with the golden rod and the, the stripping medium for shooting the you know burning the plates. Then they would put them on the offset press, and we would have our underground newspaper flyer and then we'd go back and try and convince people that it was something you should buy. And somewhere in there I you know I painted signs for stores. You know, that's an interesting art right there. That's mm -hmm. tough on glass. You know, and uh, I did urban renewal landscape and and concept sketches. And you just had to learn perspective to do it. And I would, I'd just go to the library and kind of do the cone of perspective thing and, and figure it out. And then I would deliver these sketches and I would get paid for them. I did all sorts of things. I don't know what came first. I know that by the time I was, I think when I was 15, I thought looking at comics, I was looking at some superhero comics and I was looking at the figure work and I was feeling quite critical. I felt like I could draw those figures better than I was seeing in the comic. So there was a glimmer of professional ambition sort of unconsciously in place there. And I must have migrated towards it. Eventually somewhere in Kmart I must have looked in the books and said, where are these things published? And read that they were published in New York. And I went, okay. And when I was 17, I left home. And I think by the time I was 19, I had hitchhiked to the East Coast in Colorado, <laughs> looking cool. for work. Cool. And I did that a couple times. And, and by the time I was uh, 26, I was doing book covers on my second hitch out to New York. Wow, sweet. Speaking more about projects, you've done an array of work in film, and you were telling me earlier a little bit about how you were Keanu Reeves' digital stunt double in Johnny Mnemonic. What was that like? Well, I really glamorous, I can tell you. Uh, <laughs> let me describe the scene here. Uh, we, Keanu Reeves has to go into cyberspace in order to hack the evil chip that's in his own brain. So he has to access it via software, and this is realized in a 3D cyberspace dimension. And that, and we wrote our own film treatment. So there's Daryl Anderson, myself, and Gene Bodio are doing this special effects scene. 
and we've roped in a couple other guys to help us out. And one of them is James Allen Higgins. And Jim has a very, very unlovely role in all of this. He did many other things that were more sophisticated, but we're down in Gene Bodio's basement and his Sharpays are jumping around and barking and making smells. And, and we have our maquette inside of this iris computer and and it's dressed up in the clothes and the, the head we've made for it and it's waiting for commands to move. And like some sort of Led Zeppelin cover, there's this huge black cube that must be about a foot and a half square on each side and it's a magnet and that magnet senses these floating things that are taped to my body that are called the flock of birds and they're taped to your wrist, they're down in your pants, they're in your underwear, they're in your, you know, they're everywhere. Right, right. And, and this cube, you disturb its magnetic field by moving the flock of birds and when you disturb the field, that's turned into numbers, those are quantified and they're thrown at the maquette and reinterpreted in the software and they make the maquette move. They, make, right, our little, right. they make our little puppet Keanu Reeves move around. And so we're in the basement and like I say, these dogs are smelly and Gene is busy <laughs> cursing and yelling at us and, and Keanu has to float in cyberspace, right? So there I am standing around in my underwear and I'm telling James Allen Higgins <laughs> and I have this tape all over me and I say, all right, James, you know, and I weighed like about 220. I'm not a small yeah, guy, yeah. I'm 6'1". And, and, and he has to lift me up and dance with me like I'm his Ginger Rogers and he's my Fred Astaire. <laughs> 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 we're heaving around this basement, we're doing double takes, and the dogs are barking, and this is the glamour of digital special effects, folks. I'm telling you, there is no higher space in the world than the basement somewhere with dogs. Yeah. And yeah. some guy who looks at you at the end of it, this sweaty enterprise, and he says to you, you know, Rick, I don't think I need to see you for about a week or so. Is that all right? And I go, that's fine, Jim. I don't need to see you. <laughs> 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 the oh, glory man. of it <laughs> no doubt no doubt no doubt no doubt i've been curious how does the current state of the world impact your creative process we look around us right and see an array of uncanny and unprecedented global events how does the global narrative play a role in your creative process oh well of course i'd be lying if i said it didn't um even even if i were Painting to avoid it, that would still be it impacting my process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I I don't always avoid it that, because since I I search, of course, the the emotional valence of the work is going to manifest in the search. I have always had problems with trafficking as an issue. Um, abandoned children. Um, I, I think I was sensitive to it. My own upbringing was uh, complex. It, it was not, um, it wasn't very straightforward, let me put it that way. Um, I, my father was killed when I was uh, nine. And I, I had a couple of stepfathers who were worthless human beings. Um, they were bad, in fact. I think the issue of, of the rights of children, I mean, when you, when you go to so many different schools and you moved around, after a while you feel like uh, things are very arbitrary in your life and that you have very little to say about it. And then when I, wound up uh, on my own pretty young and also just the, the the bare naked exposure and vulnerability of being a coast-to-coast -coast hitchhiker you read about trafficked human beings i remember being thrown in jail when i was 15 because i'd run away you read about 
fates so much worse than your own. And you really have, you know, there but for the grace of God go I. It gets into the work. Um, give me a moment. No problem, no problem. I think it likewise propels that longing in my work for seeing a new world and and new kinds of definition of what it is to be a human being. My work is everywhere, always about, you know, we, we have this animal that is for the first time ever capable of guiding its own evolution um, outside of Darwinistic mechanisms. We literally can manipulate the genome. We can also create prostheses that are commanded by a quadriplegic to walk or write the name or whatever, you know, so we're, we're in this incredible frontier. And I think I cleaved to that very strongly because of my so powerful need as a child to escape where I was. And art was that mechanism. It was that secret bloom of dimension that you could hide, no one could take from you. You could transport it from place to place. And like all good escapes, it should escape to some place real. And it did for me. I was one of the lucky ones. It built a career. I, I have a real life based on, on that secret little window into another world. But you carry all your secrets with you into that world. And there is the longing for what we might become, what we could be. But there's also a very strong sense of... of tragic fates. I've done a number of pictures of, of um, I think in, in, in our, in our Google Drive where we've collected some pictures, there's one in the, in the, uh, in the miscellaneous part, there's one that's mm -hmm. called mm -hmm. School Fool. Right. And yeah. Let's go ahead and, and, open and open I, th I think School Fool yeah. is just a, a case of, uh, of just the, how vulnerable children are when they're shoved into these unnatural manufactured societies called schools. And that is sort of like a, a very common experience. I think I think a lot of kids go through that. So that doesn't even you don't even have to go through the eleven different schools I went through to have that experience. You can be trapped mm -hmm. in school at any age. Children just don't have any rights about what they may like or dislike. If they go home and say they don't like something, they're told to go back and do it again. Um, and I find that schools are so narrow in meeting the needs of a child that, you know, because it's this, this chock-a-block linear prog mono brain progress that, that finger painting kindergartner is soon told to put away childish things and do things in a very linear fashion and with no clear idea as to what the goal is. You're learning this because you'll need it later or, or you know, you, you wrote the best paper you could it was probably a pretty good idea, but you got downgraded for spelling. Was the paper about your good idea, or was it a spelling test? It's never made clear to you. Um, the confusion and performance prerogatives that are foisted on a child makes them, it's almost like institutionally induced amnesia. They convince you to forget everything you ever were. When you were a playing, loving, pretending, goofing, you know, tree swinging, learning engine, you're told to stop that and become this other thing. For it's even, By the time you get into seventh grade, if you say to a bunch of seventh graders, we're all gonna draw today, there may be one kid in that class or two who flips up their desktop and gets out their drawing materials. Almost everyone else looks sort of awkwardly around the room. But right, that same right. class in kindergarten, if you said, we're gonna draw today, they all flipped up their desktops. They were all getting ready to go. Mm -hmm. But they have been winnowed. They have been suppressed by this, this ridiculous idea of what it is to progress as a human being in learning. 
That's just not how children grow. I mean, you group them according to age. Children aren't really normally grouped that way. Right, That's right. an institutional grouping. And they and, and everything is very top down and collaborative paradigms are not taught at all, near as I can tell. Uh, how useful would that be in the outside world? I mean, if you could, and art is a wonderful collaborative space, you know, collaborate in painting. Um, if you had that flexibility when you went into the outside world, you might more readily collaborate in business. But that is not easy for a centralized authority to govern. So and essentially schools become self-regarding institutions. They say their mandate is to uh, educate the child, but their mandate really is to maintain the jobs of those who operate the institution. Mm -hmm. And a centralized authority finds it easier to administrate a large institution like that by telling everyone what to do in lockstep and in a sort of a linear ladder of steps. And and that's not really how children grow. So they sort of stop growing. Their learning levels off it, and it goes at a crawl. There are some students who can handle it. They'll be fine. They'll get out the other side. They may even be celebrated. And there's nothing wrong with that. But all the other students who don't handle it well are given this alternative message. They're not good enough and they are made casualty. And it's a terrible waste. Now, I think because I went to 11 different schools, I soon learned that school was my enemy, I think. And, <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. and since I, the childish thing I wouldn't put away, which was art, was the thing that I hid out in. So it was part of a continuum of learning for me that had not been destroyed. And I found the, the school model more suspect because I had to go through it so often, it was eventually borne in upon me that this was kind of a tough road to hoe and I didn't like it very much. Those may be responsible for my sensitivity to the larger issue of what happens to children. So when trafficking rears its ugly head, I just it just, it just sort of kills me when I see it. There are other things, of course, uh, the, the plight of the earth. Um, Greg Manchester, who's a wonderful artist, did a, a show at the Society of Illustrators, uh, the, the Museum of American Illustration in New York, and he asked me to contribute some paintings. I did four for that. Yeah, Greg's a great, and, Greg's a great guy. And yeah, he's a wonderful guy and a wonderful painter. If absolutely, I was going to take absolutely. a lesson in just how to paint, I might do it with Greg. <laughs> just, <laughs> just sit there and say, man, Good show answer. me Good what answer. you do. It would be lovely. Uh, but the, the thing is that it was so easy to do those paintings. They just flowed because all I had to do was tap into that dark well of disquiet about the planet's fate. Mm -hmm. So the, the method I employ for seeing, you know, you really can point it any direction. Sometimes it will take its own head and point you at some direction that's highly uncomfortable to be there. Mm -hmm. um, it's really painful. And there are paintings that I thought were so painful that I wiped them out. I simply mm -hmm. just didn't, I just didn't need to see it. Mm. So true. That's a conversation that doesn't get enough airtime. So what are some specific ways that you think art education plays a role in making us more complete humans? Well, that is a wonderful arena to so sort of go poking around in. Um, referencing my last diatribe about education, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I could easily imagine uh, an alternative to those experiences that would keep that casualty list from being so high because many, many, many people come out of those institutions uh, maimed. Um, it, it, I, you, you, you think about gangs and drug addiction and, and or, or just self-harm uh, suicide, all, all these people have started out as little children and there, there was no given or prediction, some sort of Malthusian like, well, some must just fail and we have to accept a certain percentage of them are just not going to turn out very well. Uh, I remember when I was teaching at your school that one semester, um, I had a professor there said, well, one of the first things I do, I guess, I guess he was trying to give me some tips. 
one of the first things I do is I tell the class, I said, you know, this is his tough love regime. You know, mm -hmm. only 10 to 15% of anyone here in this room has any chance whatsoever at all of making it anywhere in art. So I think he was just trying to tell them that they need to be serious if they were going to make the cut. Right, right. And I thought, that's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is. <laughs> and, I mean, I like the guy, but I said, Jesus, that's just an awful thing to say. Yeah. And yeah. so I, I brought up that quote in my class, in my first ever class at AIB. And uh, I said, I said, this is what I've heard. I said, I'm here to tell you that I think we should turn that statistic on its head. And, and highly probable that you can do it if you want to you know just let me show you how and that's the way i taught from that vantage point let me maximize your chances of getting through breaking through mm -hmm. this and looking back at the earlier school models grammar school and whatnot and i think of all the casualties i see there one of the things that gets cut out of budgets all the time, and I don't really realize, I don't think people really realize how incredibly costly this is. That's because the long term view of the cost is not calculated for. It. But if you, instead of cutting drama programs and music programs and art classes and sculpture classes and all, all manner of, of arts, you, if you instead promoted that, say you have a kid who not an actor per se but wants to be part of the drama program and is set to the task of helping build and design the sets well this kid doesn't like math but has to build a set and doesn't really think of it as math just gets that you know right angle out gets the hammer out starts measuring foot you know board feet starts hammering things together, learning, paying attention to what other people, someone else is doing technical lighting, starts paying attention to what the electricity is actually doing, how you have to wire for it, do all these other things. And these were people who didn't like science or math classes. But now in a very organic way, learning the way children really do learn, they start learning that which is necessary for them to have that fun, that incredible place to be. And they are no longer a casualty. They're no longer dismissed as uh, non-math-minded or non-science-minded or, or not really capable of good rational reasoning or what have you. And in fact, they feel valued, which is even more important. They kind of go, I'm, I'm a part of something. People, it matters that I'm here. Look at the thing we built. It's there. It's for real. I'm real. They get validated all along the way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, if that looks expensive to a school program, I can understand if they get budget cutbacks and everything and they get a lot of emphasis on, on like, we need to do STEM, which is science and engineering and that sort of math and stuff, and forget about the arts. Um, the long-term cost is who are in the prisons? How much does that cost? Who are in the gangs? How much does that cost? Who's dead with a needle in their arm? That costs quite a bit. Where'd they come from? Who told them they were trash? Facts, all facts. Let's jump into the audience and grab a question. Next up, we have Julian calling from New Jersey. Thanks for joining us, Julian. What's your question for Rick? Good morning, Garrett and Rick. Uh, it is a lovely day here in good old Jersey. Um, so um, thanks, Garrett, for inviting me to, to ask the question of Rick. This, I've been thinking about it on the drive uh, to work this morning. And Rick, one of the things that I remember fondly from my visit to your studio back in, I think it was 2008, or 2007 with Jim's class was uh, your jamming, like the you paint with another another artist on the same uh, canvas or panel, 
and you just kind of riff off each other. I guess that was the coolest idea you know, to my young mind. But um, I was, I'm curious, like if you could jam with anyone in history, um, alive or dead, who would it be and why? Um, I think it's interesting considering how often you talk about uh, like the intersection of science and uh, cognition um, and art and creativity and like where all that comes from and uh, so yeah I'd love to hear who you would love to just paint with on like, any given Sunday for um, thanks and can't wait to hear the whole interview Julian thanks so much and uh and keep your eyes on the road while you're driving there. <laughs> and uh, it's good to hear from you. And your question is a tasty one. It's the kind of tasty question, however, that I sometimes find just a little, a little too almost nifty. Is, is that the word I want? The idea of, of there being a person that I could pick that way is so tidy and and impossible for me there are so many people with whom I I would feel like collaborating with and I can't put one ahead of the other and some of them are famous and some are unknowns I like collaborating with children they, they blow my mind um, I think, I think that it requires also the collaborator you're thinking about to be up for collaboration. And I don't know how many people feel that way. You know, I have met people who felt extraordinarily awkward about the idea of collaboration, even affronted as if it was such a, there, there's such a myth of it being an individualist kind of uh, domain, you know, you're the little monarch and you're, and, and you're you wouldn't dare uh, fray the, your identity by sharing a painting's execution with someone else, uh, as if somehow it might damage your, your ego, I guess. Uh, I've never had that problem, it doesn't bother me at all, I've uh, painted with a lot of different artists and I came up, I think, that's how I learned, was through collaboration. My uh, studio mates back in Colorado Springs, since we loved comics and there was already this ready-made paradigm of someone penciling and someone else inking and we would switch off those chores with one another, that became a huge learning thing for me. I mean, really, I, I referred to that when I tried to figure out how I turned pro because essentially, since I lack formal education, the idea of collaboration became central to me as the thing I suspected of making me sophisticated enough to actually be paid for art. It was collaborating with those guys that accelerated my growth. So collaboration worked to introduce me to that which was not me, but in the same picture. And I would sort of absorb the other guy's chops. and. Then, since it was all put together in that picture, I could then in my next picture, without collaborating that with that person, but of course, somehow, internally, mentally collaborating with them, execute something very like that in the next picture. The, the, the exploration had gone further, the frontier had expanded through collaboration. And it was a very powerful learning environment. I think that's how I turned pro, and so I became less, less uh, choosy about who I would collaborate with, and it became more about who wanted to collaborate, who was up for it, who was bold enough to risk on behalf of collaboration. And I've been very, very fortunate there. Some of the cats, because most people who are bold enough to collaborate have a fair self-assessment that they aren't going to be damaged by collaboration. If a thing ascends and then nosedives right before their eyes, they, they're so solid in their sense of themselves 
that that doesn't really hurt. And that's a good person to collaborate with because then they don't hold back either. They really load it on. And I have, I'm, I again, I have such wonderful people to work with. So I don't really go around filled with longing about who I could collaborate with. I can barely keep up with those I do collaborate with. But I'm usually just open to it. If someone's game, that is the strongest recommendation for collaborating with them that I can think of. I may not even have ever met them before, but if they are game and we have time and space to do it, then I'm typically up for it. Thank you, Julian, for your question. Rick, let's explore the themes behind your work. When I see your paintings, I'm drawn into a space where fantasy, science fiction, reality, and the abstract collide. So who and what are some of the influences that inspire your subject matter? Ah, well, as mentioned earlier, we we talked about, you know, the present era. Right, and right. It's, and it's, it's, it's huge juggernaut issues that are facing all of us. That, of course, works its way as thematic material. Um, the stuff that may be more custom to me, that, that earlier thing about a contemplation of what it is to be human is not for me simply coming up with really good renderings of human beings and saying, oh, I've really captured the essence of being a human being. Um, there are people who do that pretty well, and that's fine. They don't need me. I tend to speculate on what it is to be a human being, and I think that is sort of being a human being, if you do speculate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's intrinsic, and that works much better for me if that's evident in the painting. So my little science fiction heart from long ago um, left being an illustrator and just realized that science fiction as a, or speculative fiction or speculative thought was, was enough to author its own art. It didn't need to be a sidecar. It's illustration to literature. It was, it was enough to be an art form. I mean, I, I'm, I'm always sort of surprised that people think of science fiction art typically as illustration, but science fiction rock and roll is rock and roll. I, I don't quite get that, but um, science fiction art, if you will, is just flat out art speculative art and in that arena um, I like to look at those things I mentioned earlier you, you have a you have a quadriplegic moving a robot arm with her mind that's a frontier what does that look like if we extrapolate on that what does that look like if we have uh, increasing control over the genome with with CRISPR Cas9 to edit genes what are the issues there? And they are real issues too. Bill McKibben talks about the definition of family as being so cornerstoned how we conceive of ourselves. We build a lot of things on top of that cornerstone. We build tribe, we build uh, council, we build nations with that as the brick at the bottom of the building. But if you go around and alter the definition of what it is to be family by custom editing genes such that Sally has gotten 20% of her genome got custom genetics in it to make her smarter and brighter and faster than her parents. And then and then Anna comes along and she has 30% and she's 10% smarter, brighter, and faster than Sally. What does that do to the concept of family? And do those children look at their parents as quite as much their parents as they would have? Do they see them quite as much each other's sibling as they would have? What are we doing with this super science to to ourselves. Now, that's kind of a, a scary thing, but it's a scary thing I can approach and paint. It's a scary thing I can approach in a digital imaging or where I use both in the same picture, which I do a lot. Um, that speculation is just snake fascinating to me. When you start building new kinds of human beings, some of this will be done in an arms race. I absolutely do not trust the, the super nations to, to stick to a protocol against fucking around with the genome. I'm dead certain there's going to be an effort to create super soldiers eventually, or some kind of different sort of custom-made individuals who will find that part of their genome is patented and owned by someone else. These things are big deal things. They may even be done in response to other pressures. What kinds of people can survive the coming world? 
What sort of elect have we got? What club are you part of? What kind of money is necessary to, to have you be part of that technological club? And if you're outside of it, what are your chances? All of this is part of the realm of this, this new way of seeing and thinking that I prosecute. And my methods in terms of, of uh, the sort of neurological triggers I use to see with, that's one part of what I have to talk about how I do, you know, those, those neurological pathways, the grid cells, the place cells, the navigational apparatus in the brain. But when I start talking about thinking with those things, I think about this stuff I'm talking about now, and it all just in a spectrum, one blends over into the other. And big science is a huge part of how I think about my subject matter and its results, the orphaned, the relic, the, the propelled, that, that affects what I paint. Mm. Mm. You've also created artwork for theatrical performances. So how is creating paintings for literature or theater different from the paintings you're jamming on purely for yourself? Well, it can be different from assignment to assignment, obviously. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, some illustration can be quite tight. I mean, all, all the way up to and including, you know, things that have to be specified from. So they have to be, you know, measured and worked out. And then other things are much more artist to artist. Um, with Amanda Palmer, that gig uh, that I did for the, she, she was putting together a production of Cabaret for the American Repertory Theater. It was brilliant. She did an incredible job. But the only reason I wound up there is that Neil Gaiman came by the studio and he had Amanda in tow. And that was when we first met. And she was just sort of rocketing around the studio. And Amanda's a great, a great one for getting people up and moving and, and collaboration and anything else. She's just, you know, if, if it can be imagined, you should try it. And so she's running around the studio and she says, I've got to get you to work on this project I've gotten. And it was Cabaret. And I went, yeah, fine, great. And then she just leaves you to your own devices. That's it. Bang. You've gotten your brief. And, <laughs> That's cool. Uh, That's cool. So, so with that, I got some big boards out and I got one of my daughters, Nora, to come and mess up the boards. And we used a pan of white paint, house paint, and a pan of black house paint and big rollers and big chunks of masonite. And we grounded those boards in these highly abstract roller abstracts. Literally, the one, the one roller would pick up the black marks from the other roller and then reprint it in a successive way across the white to the black and transiting out. Beautiful effects, wonderful abstractions for just the grounds of these paintings. And then they were large, so we would sit them on the floor and Nora and I would walk around the paintings and I'd say, and they were the black and white grayish, smoky looking things, and I'd say, well, I sort of see an airplane here diving at a skyscraper almost. And Nora would say, that's too King Kong really, Dad. <laughs> and say, oh yeah, you're right. And, and she'd say, but come over here and look at it from this angle. And I'd kind of go, oh, wow, what is that? You know. And by degrees, I went, all right, I need to work on these, these provocative visions that are coming out of this smoke. And, and Nora helped me, Nora's helped me with other things. So is Kate for that matter both been terrific that way but I started using these boards to provoke a vision now the thing is the gray ashenness was something that was deliberate that was because in cabaret which I didn't realize until I saw the play all these people are dead they're all going to be murdered by the Nazis these these are the tales of ghosts only the MC who's a supernatural character really played by Amanda in this case really knows what's going on mm -hmm. and and so i wanted these to almost look like you had projected slides black and white slides of, of, of people who once were on smoking cinder and ash and ruins that's how i wanted it so they're like they're sort of like full color 
paintings of black and white images, which sounds odd, but that's sort of how they come off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and to have that kind of ghostly effect. And so I'm tuning it to what Cabaret is about, or so I think. And these paintings did quite well, actually. One of them won a medal at the Society, and, and that was very surprising since I hadn't really thought of them as illustrations, but of course, in some sense, they must be considered that. They were, they were the gallery walk for the theater. Um, and that was probably one of the most fun sort of illustration jobs, if you want to call it that, that I've ever had. But you can see how different that would be when you have to illustrate very specifically, uh, say, a book that has a famous rocket in it that's really well described by the author, and then the art director says, paint that rocket. And you go, okay. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that has to be much tighter sort of thing. Or this is a this is a this is an antler headed princess in the forest. And that's what I want. And you go, alrighty then. And you can do that. That's not as much fun typically. It is fun for some people, but I have done antler headed things before just arriving at them, and that was more fun than actually being told to do it. Yeah, yeah. And that leads to the next question. How do you see the current state of the art world? How do you view it changing? Is it moving forward, backward, or sideways? Oh, I think it's definitely moving forwards, backwards, and sideways. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think it's moving in all sorts of directions. And it's moving as many different ways as there probably are artists. Basically, it's super exciting, but in, it's, it's probably more the venue that is is more characterizable in terms of forwards and backwards. I don't think galleries are what they were because they don't work for artists the way they used to work for artists. Uh, increasingly, galleries have offloaded more and more of the risk onto the artist. It can be shipping, it can be insurance, it can be any number of things. And they also take more instead of uh, 30% they want, 40, 50, sometimes even 60% of whatever the piece will bring. And again, you know, the artist is, and is the gallery very good? I mean, are, are they, is it got a real dealer in there who's busy trying to connect things? Or are they just throwing as many lines into the stream as they can by having bunches and bunches of artists and whoever they get a nibble on, they make a profit off of, and everyone else just kind of falls into the darkness of their purview. They don't really care about them. They didn't get anything. They didn't try and deal them. They didn't try and promote them. They just worked the odds. So galleries have become, I mean, there's notable exceptions, of course, but galleries have become, uh, and it may not be their own fault. I mean, they've been forced by circumstance to, to perhaps pursue those kind of economic models. I, I don't really know. I just don't find them as interesting. Now, there are a couple of gallerists I do work with on occasion, just because they're interesting people. But, they, they'll call me up and talk me into something. Um, I find publishing much more interesting as per my earlier statements about having a really affordable book be kind of a battery pack of art to go mm -hmm. out there and affect and do what it can. Yeah, you're not seeing the originals, but still, this is pretty good. And how much do you really have to see the originals to get, I'm on fire about art again. Um, I didn't see the originals when I saw those comic books and they put me on fire. Or those those murky book covers on Kmart book racks, I was on fire. So I know that people are capable of, you know, being handed a fairly intense stimulus and taking it from there. So that's fine. Now if I want to, if it's a market question, how do you make a living off of art? Uh, even that's opened up. I think venues change that. So much stuff is happening on the web, and there are web galleries and whatnot. Though the web galleries sometimes strike me as to throw as many fishing lines out in the stream as you can model, and less promotional. But the, the personal touch doesn't strike me as much evident there. But there are, I'm sure, ways I haven't even thought of, or maybe even seen, going on right now and the art itself is exploding and there's a lot more collaboration i think out there now um so i i'm glad of all that i've narrowed my focus quite a bit because there are a few things that i want to get done so 
to get too lost in the candy land of the web and elsewhere to think about this question would detract from that focus. It's not that it isn't worthy of it, it would be good to go pursue those things. But I'm sort of at the limits of my being able to talk about it if when I run up against what I actually want to do right now. Um, and so I'm pretty positive about art finding sneaky, squishy ways around the various ways it's prohibited from existing and still continuing to exist because people are people and they want to do art. Right, right, absolutely. And, uh, you know, every artist is unique in their own right. And there are some special qualities they need to have in order to survive and thrive. So what do you think it takes to remain a working artist for the long term? And what should artists, specifically painters, be thinking about when taking on fine art or illustration as a career? Yeah, that's a good one there, because I have definitely made missteps that probably proved me really valuable if they hadn't almost killed me. Um, mm -hmm. There are things that, that, because there are measures inside of that, and those measures you take very personally. Um, when you think about a career, you're also thinking about being acceptable. At bottom, that's got to be there. And so how well your work succeeds or how it does... Now, it can be lowest common denominator. Sex sells, you know. That's not really a very... That's not really a very high achievement, but you can get accepted and you can make money. It's, you know, one step away from and maybe not even a step away from being a hack. The other side is that, you know, you really want to do something meaningful, sharp, uh, distinctive, but that the, the resistance goes up for being able to pitch that, to being able to sell that, because the market wants money and it doesn't want to have to do a lot to get the money. So that's why hacks do really well. And people have, I mean, you know, you could say, you could say by the measure of money, you could say, at one point, Phil Hale made this example to me once. He said, by the measure of money, you could, he was arguing with someone else, and he said, uh, you know, if, if you think the fact that someone has sold so much is, is a sign of how good they are, you could say Madonna was the greatest songwriter on earth because, uh, you know, she made so much money and Elvis Costello didn't make nearly as much money. Mm -hmm. And instantly you kind of go, yeah, no, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> if you're everyone's second favorite beach read, but your first favorite beach read is more articulated, more outre, more thoughtful, but is unlikely to be lowest common denominator, like everyone's second favorite beach read, everyone's second favorite beach read is going to make more money and it's going to be at the top of the number one bestseller list. It's not the best book. It's just the lowest common denominator. Fifty Shades of Grey. How many people can get into that? Well, it's a huge seller. It's also what it is. <laughs> um, so you throw yourself up against these false measures of what it is to be successful. Am I good? Well, if you're not making a living, the temptation... Well, even people look at you like, you, you know, you're just not dude, you're just not really good enough, or there's something wrong with you. You're, you're wrong to want to do art because you can't make a living at it, or you're not making a very good living at it, or this, or that, and the other. It's a real peril to self-esteem, self-concept. So how do you tread it? You know, what do you do for work, and what do you do for your soul, and how do you do that balancing act? I've been through the ups and downs of that, and it can be quite painful. And you have to be robust in order to face its various weathers and vicissitudes. I think the key to that robustness is where you have to start. And that, for me, goes all the way back to an example I mentioned earlier. That little kid who's finger painting or making art is not thinking about if it's acceptable to anyone else is not even aware there might be an audience, has no reason to do it for that. They're 
on fire. They're alive. They know it's good and they know they're good when they think about it. And it's a brick at the bottom of everything that they should build their personality on. If you can not be driven off of that sense of self, if that institutionally induced amnesia that schools, I mean, schools are, are not there to educate you. They're there to make employees. They're, met, they're there to create people who can read and follow instructions. That's the only reason literacy was ever pushed. Capitalism had, industrialism had machines that if you didn't read the instructions, those machines would kill you. You, you right, had right, to teach right. people how to read and write. And it wasn't because they wanted you to think, they wanted you to follow instructions. The little kid is thinking, if you can hang on to that about yourself, instead of having it replaced with this other model, when you go through those rough times, you're like, wow, you know, I have to rethink about how I'm doing this art and everything. And yeah, maybe you do. And I have to work out how to still make it cool, but still make it sellable and everything. Yeah, maybe you still have to do that. But at least your self-concept won't take such a terrible hit if you never lose sight of that little fucking proto-genius that you started out as and who didn't care about any of that thing because they already knew they were good. They already knew this was thrilling to be here. It had to pay off. I just have to stick with it. That can sustain you through all those negative weathers that you are certainly going to face if you try and make a career in art. Wow, that's good advice. So question of the day. I always like to conclude the show with a question or an inspirational comment from our special guest to the audience. So what do you want them to start thinking about? Okay. I would like to make it clear that this is not a club. The Impressionists, I think, once and for all, did away with that idea. Before them, it was the Salons, it was the Oath of Horatii, it was Ang, it was David, everything had to be perfect. The Impressionists did paintings relying on their viewership to be able to complete the painting in their own head. In other words, and here's the thing, the way a person sees art must involve the same faculty that had to have been used to make the art. Whether you're an artist or not, the Impressionists demolished that club. They said, we think our viewing public is at least as sophisticated as we are, and they will get this. And boy, did they. The same faculty thing is the statement. Yes, yes. We're, we, we belong to each other. We, this, this is the mastery that we are able to share. We're a collaborative species. That's the way we're made. It is our ascendance. Language was created so that you could read my mind. I speak and you read what's in my head. You speak and I read what's in your head. We share our minds and we have invented astonishing things to do it. Art's one of those astonishing things. You heard it, folks. If you like what you've seen and heard today, find and follow Rick on Instagram at Rick Berry Studio. Also, look below in the video description and you'll see a link to where you can buy Rick's latest book, Invented People. So get your copy while you can. We'll be back in the future with more of Rick's creative process. And Rick, was that a good time or what? It was, it was great. It was good talking with you again and you know, I wish you were not a whole continent away for <laughs> us to do some me. painting together. I know, right? And I can't wait until the next time we do. All right. Very good. Well, well, brother, thank you again for joining us today on episode number two of the Creative Process Podcast. You're an inspiration, my friend, to many, and of course, myself as well. Right. Thank you, my friend. 100%. Appreciate you, man. All right, ladies and gents, thanks so much for tuning in. This is Garrett Campbell Wilson, a.k.a. G Cam Will, and we have lots to look forward to coming up next on The Creative Process. And we'll be back soon with more inspiration for your creative fire. So don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button. Also, be sure to join our Facebook group, The Creative Process, and follow me on Instagram at G Cam Will. Check out the links below in the description.
Once again, I want to thank all of you for listening. Take care of yourselves. See you in Digi. Chihamwa. Chihamwa. Chihamwa.